Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I know it's the end of the day, and it's great to have a full room. We'll try and get through this quickly so you can get the beer from outside and go to the parties and everything else. But uh, hopefully this full attendance reflects the uh, uh, importance and interest in this topic, which we're definitely seeing um, out in the field. So just introduce myself. I'm Neil Levine. I do product management at Red Hat for Ceph. I have Sean Cohen, who's uh, on the product management side on the OpenStack side, and we have down there Gorka, who might join us for a little brief demo halfway through, who's uh, one of the core developers on Cinder. Uh, so this is this talk is um, we're just saying here we did it. I think it was at the last summit. We'll probably do it again at the next summit because it's definitely a work in progress. And for those of you who went to the Cinder talk this morning, would have heard some you know, uh, commentary on the state of volume replication and volume backup and so on in Cinder. So we're going to cover um, some of the options that we think are out there at the moment. Um, some, of them, some work pretty well, some not so perfect, and we're going to show you where we're going here. So first of all, we'll explain a little bit about just how OpenStack and Ceph works from a multi-site perspective to start off with. It does assume you have some basic knowledge, but we'll go through some of the components. And then we're going to go through sort of four use cases or topologies about how we think you can lay this out here, which have varying levels of uh, complexity and trade-offs and elegance. And we'll sort of paint the picture of where we think this is going, certainly in the Liberty session towards the, the nirvana of perfect multi-site and disaster recovery. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to uh, Sean to uh, kick things off. All right. Thank you, Neil. So the first topic uh, is, of course, looking at uh, uh, OpenStack disaster recovery. This is actually my third talk on the subject. And this is, as Neil mentioned, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, we cannot finish it in one cycle, that's obviously. And it involves a lot of services. It, yeah, it's block storage. Is, is not, it's just a simple piece, right? When your site goes down in flames, you need to all the services being available on the other sites actually to, to restore. Uh, and we need there's a building blocks to take place. And we look at the different topologies we have for OpenStack. Um, so it starts pretty much what, what I call disaster recovery for the poor. So I have a cluster. Let's stretch it between two sites and see what happens. Um, then we have one OpenStack cluster. And of course, moving to two OpenStack clusters. And when we look at the R configurations, this is where RPO and RTO comes into play. And I have various choice all the way from having an active and cold standby to an active and hot standby. And of course, the holy grail is active active, which typically costs more. Uh, and it seems go if you look at Amazon, for example, or any other uh, uh, commercial offering for cloud, as, as you would like to get more RPO and RTO, you will have to pay more. Um, and it has to do with the investment in hardware, but it's not all. Right? So uh, if we look at RPO and RTO, uh, uh, the basic thing you could do is just have tape backup and ship it with your truck to another site. Right? That's the, the baseline. And then we move on to, if I, I need more, then I can do replication, which just can be asynchronously, asynchronously. And then I, I move up and up. And of course, mirroring uh, is, is like the, the top one. But if, even if I have mirroring, uh, which is uh, uh, continuous mirroring from one side to another. If I have a failure at the application layer, it will be copied as well to the other side. So you might have another disaster in the other side as well. This is why you need to have snapshots to protect you in both sides so you can actually restore uh, the last operation. So that's pretty much where we are in general. But what are actually involved when we talk about disaster recovery with OpenStack? So if you look at the ingredient, data is not enough. Let's say, okay, I have a method to replicate my data to the other side. Am I done? No, this is just the start. So I need to capture the metadata of the relevant uh, 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 service workload resources in order to be able to restore it in the other side. I need to ensure that the VM images are present in the target side, right? And I'm not even opening it here, but we have different configuration in the two sites. Meaning if the VM configuration has different IP uh, settings, I need actually different maybe settings in the other side. This is where we need to leverage heat, for example, to uh, uh, deploy different uh, configurations in the target site. So replication of the workload data using data replication is, is, is a start. We can have application level replication or backup restore, which is the, the initial uh, uh, fundamental step to disaster recovery. So let's start with the open set components. Um, as you know, Cindy has its own API to doing backup. 
And what notable uh, uh, milestone in the Cinder backup uh, progress is actually the ability to do uh, a backup with the metadata state. So if I'm actually backing, backing up my volume, I, I can actually back up the metadata as well. So we, if I import it even to another OpenStack site or even brand new install, I will be able to take this uh, volumes and restore them. Uh, in terms of AJA, uh, uh, just like any other uh, service in OpenStack, we have working in AJA per, uh, uh, but within a single site. Uh, today, Cinder doesn't have the notion of additional Cinder in the other end to talk to, right? Uh, uh, this is I'm my, my own domain. I'm just one Cinder. Uh, so we don't have inherent multi-site or disaster architecture built in to Cinder topology. When we look at the APIs, uh, we have volume migration already built into the API. There's other work to be done there, but that's an important milestone. We have the backup APIs I mentioned, and we have the volume replication API that was started to add in, in ISO. There's more work to be done uh, as we're going to move on. And when we look at the OpenStack Glance, Glance is the image repository, right? I need to take the images and make, make sure I can actually import them on the other side. Uh, similar to the topology, no notion of AJ. We, uh, we have a notion of AJP, but with no notion of, of a multi uh, uh, site. And of course, we have the Glance API that we can utilize. Moving to Nova. So we, here we need the metadata of the database and the volume, right? Because if I need to restore my volume on the other site, I need to have the metadata uh, uh, kept or backed up. Um, and in terms of topology, same thing, right? AJ pair, single site, no inherent multi-site. Uh, when we talk about cattle, right? Um, if should I back up my thermal volumes? We wouldn't recommend it. You can actually use snapshot to protect the thermal volumes for your boot volumes, uh, but that's not something I think we're in the scope. And uh, and of course, this is where uh, snapshots in Glance uh, uh, comes handy. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Neil, and I'm going to cover the Ceph components. So Ceph is slightly different to, um, to OpenStack. It's um, got a very, very different architecture. I won't cover that. Um, but the way, main, main way that Ceph is used within OpenStack, and the reason it's become so popular, um, is as a common storage backend to both Glance and Cinder and Nova. And you know, this is because it does copy and write. It can do thin provisioning. So it's an incredibly uh, versatile and, and sort of good way of doing storage for all of the different, different services. Um, the, the main mechanism we have right now within, with RBD is what we call RBD exports. And it's a sort of a fairly low level tool um, where you can actually export an RBD volume as an image. It actually comes out as a file that gets put into you know, standard out. You can pipe it into standard in somewhere else. So it's, it's, you know, it's pretty low level, but it makes it versatile. It means you can encode it into scripts. You can you know, use SSH pipes and so on to sort of move images around. And critically, when you do these RBD exports and imports, they're incremental by default. So the first time you run it, it'll take a full dump of the image. The second time, third time, it will be incremental only. So you don't have to worry about, you know, am I, is it incremental or full? It'll just do it incremental for you by default. So it's so pretty versatile. Um, what we're currently working on, or I say we, the, the engineers are working on, um, is what we're calling RBD mirroring, which is sort of the next stage of that, which is volume replication, or to work with the volume replication API in Cinder. So right now we're still putting in the low level sort of foundations um, and we're sort of targeting that work for, um, uh, for the beginning of next year. But this will allow us to sort of do effectively live streaming of an image from site A to site B. So you don't have to say go and back it up, you just say once, replicate it and that's ongoing uh, for any image within a pool. And there's, if you're interested in the architecture, please join the mailing list where you can sort of get involved with um, you know, suggesting how you want to use this feature. But that's, that's currently in progress. People also use the Rados Gateway, or RGW, uh, which is the uh, Swift and S3 interface to your Ceph cluster. Um, so this is you know, typically used by tenant applications rather than the underlying infrastructure itself. If you're using RBD everywhere, um, you may use RGW for your backups as you'll see, um, but typically this is about your user's data. The multi-site capabilities there, we have what we call the sort of the V1 implementation, which came out about a year and a half ago, which is, it's a, basically it's an active-passive uh, pair, but explicitly between sites. Um, so an eventually consistent layer that sits on top of your, your Ceph cluster, which will mirror the data from site A to site B. 
Um, I think it's fair to say it was kind of like, you know, we call it a V1 with all the implications there. It's, it works. Um, it's a little bit sort of brittle to set up, but once you've got it up and running, it's, um, it does its job. But what we're working on now is a sort of a V2 implementation of that to sort of get to a sort of a full mesh active, active um, uh, uh, cluster design for multi-sites. Um, so slightly closer to kind of how Swift does it, but still with the strong consistency of Ceph at the low level in each individual site. Okay, so armed with knowledge of OpenStack, which has you know databases filled with metadata, and um, they're running in HA pairs, and they have some API capabilities, and sometimes they don't. And hopefully, armed with a little bit of knowledge about Ceph, we're going to explore sort of some of the different use cases. And we've got four that we've sort of lined up in order of um, complexity and and uh, sort of features. So the first one, of course, is uh, you know the most obvious thing. Hey, I just want to take my clusters and stretch them. Um, this is not recommended. Both OpenStack and Ceph were not really designed to run across WAN links with high latency um, you know, across geographies. They can work in campus environments, and we definitely have users doing that in campus environments. Um, but you've got to pay a lot of attention to you know, the latency of your links, the reliability of your links, and so on. So it's kind of, you know, phone, for, uh, phone up for, for advice from consultants and everything else if you're thinking of doing that. But as a, a first order step, this is not really what you should be doing if you really are thinking about sort of proper DR between continents or you know, between coasts of, uh, of a country and so on. Um, if you do it with Ceph in particular, you have to pay a lot of attention to where you're putting your monitors. Um, you know, there's a lot of settings that you have to sort of tune to to make it aware that it's, got, it's operating across high latency links, but not really recommended. So the, the first use case is really just using Cinder Backup which um, you know, we call this the control Z capability here, which is a very user-centric thing. Your user has deleted a volume by accident, you know, operator error on the horizon console or wherever it happens to be, and you want to sort of give the user an option to sort of get back from that. And that's really what Cinder Backup is for. So here you're going to take one OpenStack cluster, you're going to keep it in site A, but you are going to provision two separate set clusters in different physical locations, one which is the, the origin and one which is going to be for the backup. So, Whilst this has kind of been designed for, for end users, we have some ways of allowing the admin to take advantage of it as well. So here's a kind of a, a very simple map of the topology. And yes, it's simple, which means it's simple to set up. You're just relying on the API, um, uh, but you know, not, not that fully featured in terms of sort of giving you a, a sleepless night if you're an admin here. So, so the issues you have with it, of course, is you know, your, your Cinder service in site A has to be very, uh, you know, that's the authoritative one. You've got to make sure that the data is looked after. You're, you're sort of keeping um, uh, all the metadata safe and backed up and so on. Um, you can pick different backends. It doesn't have to be Ceph. It doesn't even have to be RBD. You can use RGW or OpenStack Swift or any other object store, even S3, um, you know, Shim, to sort of to move, to move your backups over. But as I said, if you do use RBD, it's incremental by default, which is a huge uh, benefit if you're moving very large volumes across. Um, the limitations when you're using Cinder Backup are that uh, you know, the volume can't be in use. It has to be unmounted. It doesn't really handle backing up of snapshots. It's a fairly primitive API call, which really just works for sort of a simple unmounted Cinder volume you want to send over to site B. So again, as a user, you can do that through the API or using Horizon. But the goal is to make admins take advantage of this um, with this topology to give them some sleepless, uh, uh, you know, get over the sleepless nights they may be having. And I will introduce Gorka to explain some of the work we've done here to, uh, to improve, um, improve this tool for, for admins. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think everyone will hear me. Uh, OK. That one's. OK. In this, this next cycle, we are going to address some of the missing features in uh, Cinder Backup. For example, we are going to decouple the Cinder volume from Cinder Backup service, so uh, Cinder Backup will be uh, able to uh, scale out. We'll also include the snapshot backups, and we're looking into uh, scheduling the, the, backup, the backups as well. In the meantime, how can you solve these missing features? Is uh, using, for example, cron job, Cinder client, uh, Python API, and some scripting. This way, you can uh, create automatic uh, backups. The, for example, the, the administra administrator can uh, back up all tenants' volumes and choose whether he wants to make uh, these backups visible to the tenants or to keep just them hiding. hidden. Um, 
you can also uh, export all the backup me metadata so it can be automatically imported later on. And uh, for example, you can as well create a, a backup for in-use volumes, which uh, means that you have to create a temporary uh, snapshot and a temporary volume to, to do the backups and then delete them. And uh, you can also control how many backups you want to, to keep in the backend. So then with a sliding window and you delete the older ones. Uh, now we are going to see a small demonstration on what, what this kind of a script would look like. And um, uh, something important to, to notice is that when uh, we are going to run the, the list commands is three commands altogether, which will show the uh, Cinder volumes available. Uh, it will show as well the, the, what the Cinder backup uh, sees as the backups and the, what the script sees uh, as the backups. And uh, we will have, uh, this is a ve very basic uh, demo, so it's easier to follow. Um, because we will have only one demo tenant. No, did you start already? Yeah, no, 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 no. Where's my control Z button? Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, um, uh, the demo tenant will have uh, only one volume, but it will be in use. It will have already one uh, automatic backup done. And we, the admin will have one uh, volume as well, but this, will, this one will be available. And uh, it will also have one uh, backup of that, that uh, volume. So here we run the list. We see that we have one volume in use. What there, oh, there's, there, there was supposed to be some callouts uh, showing where everything was, but okay. Now, this is the administrator view, you can see it there. And he also has one available volume, uh, but he has two backups because he's seen the tenant's backup since he did it himself, even though it's the tenant. Okay. Now, we are going to, to fire uh, the, the script to create backups for all the tenants. We are going to keep only one uh, backup uh, store in the back end, and we are exporting the, the metadata back to an FSSR directly. And we can see how it is uh, uh, for the uh, on life uh, in use volume. It creates a snapshot, then a volume, then that's the actual uh, backup then deletes the temporary volume and the snapshot. And uh, it has to remove the old backup because we only want to keep one alive. So it will repl replace the old one. For, the, for its own uh, volume, it only has to do the, the backup. OK. Now we will see the, the list of the, of the volumes and the backups. And eventually, OK, there we go. So what we can see here is that the volume IDs are OK. No, no, no. This is going to be difficult to, to show. OK, just a second. Ah. OK. Uh, the volume ID is reported by Cinder, uh, reports uh, the temporary backup, the temporary volume ID, while the, the script is uh, smart enough to, to know that that was created through a temporary volume. So it reflects the original uh, uh, volume ID. Uh, now this is what is okay. Sorry, but with the callouts, it was a lot easier to follow. Okay, the admin list that it goes.
Okay. I, I don't know why it keeps. Okay. Then uh, what? Okay, I just hit and I start talking and it will eventually get up. Okay, what we will do next is uh, detach the, the volume for the demo tenant, uh, delete it, and as an administrator, uh, also uh, delete the volume and delete all the metadata from the uh, database. So it simulates like we are in a new environment. So when we do the, the restore, we also import all the metadata back into the into Cinder. Okay, there we deleted uh, the S, uh, using my SQL, and here we do an import of the metadata as well as the volumes, and they then they are back there, all the volumes from visible from the demo. A tenant and the administrator. And now Neil will continue with the second use case. So, so the goal here is that whilst the Cinder Backup API, again, it's, it's very primitive, but you can sort of put a reasonable amount of scripting around it. So as an admin, you can back everything up. You can make it available to your users if they didn't decide to back things up. And you can restore things if you want to in a, in a reasonably clean state. So I mean, it's, it's, it's a fairly clunky way of doing things, but it's using what's you know, Cinder Backup, which is it's been around for a while. It's kind of uh, you know, some debate around its robustness, but it, it is possible to sort of give you some, some comfort that all your images are backed up. This is obviously only specific to Cinder. So what we want to cover is, well, OK, well, if you are using RBD to back both Cinder and Glance, and you're using it for Nova as well, <clears throat> so you're not just backing up Cinder volumes, you're backing up everything. How do you do that? So this is what we call the admin warehouse. Um, so again, there's only one OpenStack cluster. You've got one active. OpenStack site in, in site A. Again, we're going to run two Ceph clusters here, one in site A and B. Um, so, you know, less to deploy still here. Um, but this is not really driving it through Cinder Backup. This is kind of taking things um, at a slightly lower level here. And really, this is kind of closer to the sort of tape backup. This is really is, again, pretty primitive, but it's, it's effective. It gets the stuff backed up and perhaps adds more onto the restoration um, of the data. So here we're gonna. This is where you essentially you're just taking a MySQL dump of your of your Cinder and Glance databases, <clears throat> and you're using RBD export to, to ship the data out. So again, if you're using RBD export repeatedly, so it's taking the incremental backups, then you're going to get um, you know that, that shouldn't take too long, depending on your size of your cluster. I and mean, if it's absolutely huge, and this probably isn't isn't ideal. But if you've got a reasonably um, manageable number of volumes, and you're just synchronizing. Uh, the dumps, uh, the MySQL dumps with the RBD exports, then you've got your data in site B. It's all there sitting there. Again, it's kind of sort of like a tape in the sense of you know it's all backed up. It'd kind of be slow perhaps to restore it. Um, this is not about a speedy recovery, but it's about having a fairly safe and easy one, which you're controlling not using OpenStack services, but really the lower level components. So, um, so MySQL dump, I mean, if you don't know how to use that, then um, um, you know, I, th I think there's other sessions you might want to attend. Um, but there are, you know, there are scripts, there's one here, which, um, which go through an entire pool within um, uh, uh, Ceph. So when, you know, if you've got separate pools for Glance and, uh, um, and for Cinder or your images and volumes, you can run a script or just take a, a dump of all of those repeatedly and push them out to a second site. So you know, it's not, it's, Pretty, you know, pretty low level. Um, it won't handle sort of cleaning up lots of snapshots. You know, won't do grandfathering of things, uh, of images, and so on. Um, but you know, to, to restore the data, you essentially import the MySQL, uh, you know, the dot SQL text, and you reverse the streams on the RBD export script and just point it from you know what you've already got in site A and just go point it back to sorry what you've got in site B. Now push back to site A. So pretty primitive, but it gets the job done. Um, and so again, if you're trying to avoid a sleepless night, um, you know this is this is the most sort of low-level, non-OpenStack way of taking um, uh, a lot of the backups. So to go through the next two final future use cases, I'll over to Sean. All right. So thank you, Neil. So we saw that there's a lot of things that can actually be done already today, uh, uh, even scripted, uh, to save you the hustle. But but there's also a more front door approach, and there's work to be done. And with that, we're going to actually move to the failover side. Um, so unlike the other two topologies, this topology is actually based of two 
OpenStack clusters into Ceph clusters, right? Uh, um, the backup, unlike in the previous one that can be done from the uh, uh, tenant user, here is an admin, right, the operator uh, responsibility. Uh, we're still talking in this uh, use case, active-passive, as before. Uh, but we are using low-level tools uh, to allow us to handle the backups. Uh, so instead of using just uh, MySQL uh, uh, export and dumps, or RBD experts, uh, we're actually using uh, MSQL replication, and here we're using uh, RBD experts as well. Uh, and this is how it looks. So we have uh, two cinders, uh, uh, two OpenStack uh, uh, clusters. Uh, we have uh, SQL replication for uh, uh, the cinder. We have MySQL replication for Glance, and we use RBD experts between the sites. Now, uh, so the replication, is, uh, but not including the AJ pairs, right? But we're doing between the two nodes. Um, and unlike active-active configuration, and I think Neil touched upon it a bit, it's the consistency between the data and the database is not guaranteed. Because I'm the admin, I need to control when to take the experts, right? I need to uh, actually align the consistency windows. And again, you can automate some of it, as we saw earlier. You can schedule a cron job to do the work, but it's still, admin work to make it happen. So that's actually already two uh, OpenStax, two Ceph clusters. It, we're getting to a real failover phase, uh, but there's more to it. And that's where we want to go. Um, so our golden uh, 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 disaster recovery option will be actually an OpenStack live disaster recovery to a, a disaster recovery site. And how are we going to do it? through the front door. Instead of using tools and scripts, we can actually use the front door OpenStack that has notion of the fact it's being uh, 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 disaster recovery to another site. And today we do it, the way to do it is actually using the front door APIs. So Cinder, as you know, already uh, has Cinder replications studying ISOs. We are working on improvements as we speak to the Cinder replication. Uh, as Neil mentioned, we are working also on the RBD mirroring. Uh, that's going to make usage of the uh, uh, volume API replication of Cinder. And at last, we can use Glance replication. Uh, the, the caveat in Glance, we need to use the same FSIDs on the backup clusters to avoid uh, misconsistency. And if you look, this is just, uh, uh, I'm including a link. By the way, the, the slides will be available for download. Uh, I'm including a, a barcode at the end. Uh, so if you don't know R Glance Replicator, uh, it's pretty much a cool tool. It allows you to do uh, Glance push images, copies to the other side, uh, uh, and that can be leveraged. It's not built in as an API, but as a separate tool, but it pretty much does the, the, the same job. It, it lets us to push the images to the other side, which is a better way than just doing the, the exports. And this is what's coming up in Liberty. So I mentioned that volume replication has been here since Icehouse. However, we are trying to get more and more uh, uh, into uh, a volume replication. One of the things is actually aligning with consistency groups. So there was progress in the Kilo release on consistency groups, uh, but we still have, don't have the connection between volume replication and consistency groups. So we need to put both of them together. And the fact that we still have replication within the, cinder, the same Cinder implementation, right? It's not yet between Cinder. So volume replication v2, there's actually designed sessions this week on this topic. So if you're interested in it, uh, uh, please attend. And this will actually solve uh, the problem of data replication between two single deployments. And with the CG uh, replication, it will allow us actually uh, 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 to synchronize uh, the different volume types as well uh, what needs to be captured within the replication. Because as you know, we are serving application. The application workloads may be spread on several volumes, including database, logs, et cetera. We need to capture them in consistency state. So if you connected what I said earlier about the pain of the admin, just to do the consistency checkpoints, here it's pretty much will be built in into the API. And of course, we'll miss scheduling, et cetera, that will come next. But as you know, in OpenStack, we take granted our approach, and I think that's the, the, the way we're going. Uh, and with that, I want to hand it back to Neil to summarize. As you can see, multi-site and backup is, is not a simple thing. Um, and it's fair to say you know, it wasn't designed into the core of OpenStack at the very beginning here. Um, 
if you put all this to, to one side, there's a sort of philosophical thing here, which is if you want to really do proper uh, um, multi-site, really, you, you take a cloud approach, which is you push this up to the application, and you say, look, it's the, up to the application to pick between multiple clouds and ensure that the data is, is stored in multiple locations, and the application is handling the failover. This is kind of very much the, <clears throat> you know, the, the public cloud, Amazon-style way of doing things here, but recognizing in the private cloud, you've got admins who, you know, uh, uh, who who have, have uh, eyes on, on them and they need to sort of ensure there's backups, there's, you, know, you have to do something right now. And this is kind of what these use cases are designed to do. So just to review here, you've, you've really got a choice between making this a user-driven option where you're using Cinder Backup, which you can then optionally uh, use scripts uh, like the one that Gork is developing here to sort of make it an admin-driven workflow if, to, if you don't trust your users to, to be doing backups. If you don't want to just make this focus on Cinder, you want to expand this out to cover all of the storage that's perhaps backed by something Ceph RBD or you know, that you're storing in general with, with your images and so on, you've got to choose. Do you really want to go through, just let me get it backed up and it's going to take me a while to restore it, but at least I know it's there in some state. Um, or the use case number three, which is I, I will run active passive, I'll accept some caveats, which is um, there might be some inconsistencies which I have to clear up manually, but at least I know I can fail over to a site B in some format. Um, so you have to pretty pick, pick between the medium and what we, you know, we call the advanced use case right now. But as you can see, the goal here, which um, we're working on um, uh, both on the Ceph and the OpenStack side, is to really get to a, a true active um, failover site uh, configuration. And the work has all been done there. It's just it's going to take a time for it to, to all mesh. But hopefully, this is giving you some some ideas. And uh, in a few minutes, we've got left. If if other people are running DR in different ways. I'd be interested to hear your, your options and uh, how you're implementing it. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And with that, we're going to open it actually for uh, a short Q&A. Um, there's, as I mentioned, there's a barcode to the slides uh, with the relevant links in there. And if you, if you have a question, uh, please uh, uh, use the mic. Yeah. In the... Um, case of the passive active, uh, I mean active passive uh, topology, uh, the amount of nodes in both sites ha has to be the same or in the B site can be, I don't know, one single node or something like that? Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, it can, it can be different. Um, certainly on the Ceph side, you can choose different policies around, you know, you might want to have fewer replicas, so, you know, you have fewer nodes because you don't want to have the same level of um, uh, you know, data integrity. Um, certainly, you, can, you might want to compress several of the, the services and co-locate them, um, you know, recognizing that site B is not going to have the same kind of latency and performance characteristics of, of site A. So, no, you can, you can definitely save money by compressing things in site B. It depends what you're trying to offer your users. But as you're just you know, copying the, the, the backup and the, the, uh, um, the underlying topology that's supporting those backups can, can definitely be different. I have a question. <clears throat> um, how is RBD mirroring different than having a crush map that put, puts like two or three replicas to a different data center, you know, to the backup site? Yeah, so if you're doing things at the RADOS level, RADOS is a strongly consistent um, storage system, right? So when you're when you're when you're doing a write, it needs to get an, a successful ACK back from each copy that's been written. So if you're doing that over um, sites with high latency, that can take a long time, and applications are potentially going to be very sensitive to having that that high latency. Um, so yes, I mean if you do a split, what we call split site RADOS, you, you you can in theory do it, but it can definitely have an impact on your performance, which is expecting and wants a very quick response back. This is slightly different with mirroring, is where it's not at the RADOS level, it's at the RBD level. So you're, you're worried about copying the entire image, not just the, the RADOS objects underneath it. So you'll have a fully formed copy of the um, entire image in both sites. But as kind of relates back to the, the earlier question, you may want to have them diff differently stored. You might have, say, a 3x replica on, on site A, but you may only want a 2x replica for the site B. Um, so right now, doing that stretched RADOS, yes, you, you could do it in a campus environment, which will give you a similar kind of thing here. Um, but really, most people aren't doing backups in a campus. They're doing them geographically, and then at that, you know, wide geographies. And at that point, you don't really want to be spreading your, your crush map that far. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, next question uh, for Sean. Hi. Um, two parts. One is the some of the basic considerations of Cinder replication, all these things. Some of them would be, again, applicable for Manila. And Manila is big in liberty. So are we thinking of some of the things, at least on the replication, backup, shares, 
for Manila now that we kind of have a control on Cinder? That's so, question one. Thank you for raising the question. I was almost at the top of the tongue today this morning when we had the Manila session to uh, bring the disaster recovery, also in that scope. But yes, <laughs> the overall yes, it, it's, in, it's in the scope and it's part of, uh, as soon as you put your eggs in the open stack basket, you start to have these concerns. Uh, the, as I said earlier, I believe the work will be incremental uh, uh, because there are bigger fish to fracture, and there is delta right now between Cinder and Manila. Manila is still uh, 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 has a way to go in, in terms of implementing replication, which is not there yet, consistency groups, which is not there yet. So there is a, a, a parity yet to, to make it The work. other smaller question is, uh, now that we are talking WAN and other issues, mm -hmm. are we thinking of compression-enabled extent awareness or uh, over WAN, all those things which we had in traditional issues, I mean, that's, yeah, compression I mean, that's, enable replication. I mean, it's more about this on the storage side of things. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, certainly that's it's not part of the initial design for RBD unless Josh wants to tell me differently here. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, you, you, this is where you know you, you having incremental um, backups in your current architecture gives you some some benefit there. But yeah, I mean, it's it's something we'll we'll have to look at. But it's not part of the original scope. Um, uh, you know that that compression. It's about sort of getting as, as that eventually consistent window down as, as close as possible. Um, but I think that's an optimization once we've got like the basic architecture in place. Yeah. And again, it, it depends on the backend implementation, right? right? Some of the backends does come with the uh, compression built in. Yeah. Uh, with the, the demo, is, a, is that also available at the site? The so demo you had? You know. Uh, it should yeah, be. Yeah, it is. There's a link to the full demo with explanations, et cetera, uh, that didn't come through. Yeah, because you, you do it offline. Um, uh, one more question. So uh, with data backup, we are pretty much clear with volumes, with images. But in a situation when I need to restore uh, or if I want to have a DR site, uh, what is the approach for backing up and reload uh, for backing up networking and launching virtual machines into the same networks, into the same floating IPs, into the same load balancer groups? outside of the scope of this talk and it's a very good question <laughs> so so you are invited to my next talks on the subject but but again as I said at the beginning disaster recovery is a larger umbrella than just the block storage because th there's networking there's compute there's other there's as I mentioned heat as part of the uh, orchestration needs to be take place so this is just the today we try to tackle just the storage side but yes as soon as you're already dealing with the disaster recovery that's pretty much the next door and again Cinder, I think, right now has the only a founder API to maintain the backup uh, uh, with the megadata, but there are other ways to do it as well in network and, and compute, et cetera. So it's not, it's not uh, fully active, active, as you know, and, but the, as I said, there's incremental stuff that can be done today, just like we showed that uh, there's things you can do already today. Okay. When is the next session? Uh, <laughs> He's had three sessions already today. He's kind of he's <laughs> worn out. He's not I'm thinking about tomorrow. Open yet. the schedule, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So t uh, I think we have uh, uh, the road to enterprise storage uh, session on uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Four thirty. Four thirty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.